How many have ever had that experience where God won't let you off of something? All right? he, he, he keeps speaking it to you over and over and over and over again. All right? And that's, I think, one of the things that we seem to miss is we are so, all right, I heard that and we want to move on. But God's like, oh, yeah, you heard that, but do you get it? Do you understand it? Are you walking in it? And so I think sometimes we're too quick to move on. And God just kept really hitting this thing home with me. Uh, a few weeks ago, we talked to uh, not even intentionally got into intimacy with God when God won't let me off of that. And so we're going to be talking more about that today and really what does it mean to know him. So we're going to start off in John 17, 1 through 3. You may be familiar with that because I've used it a lot when I've been up here. Starting in verse 1. These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also may glorify you. As you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. So notice he said he's going to give eternal life, should give eternal life. And just about anywhere you see that in the, in the New Testament, it's in a subjunctive case. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Okay, It's in the realm of possibility, not inevitability. It means that some people will receive this eternal life, others won't. So now he's going to go on, verse 3, and define what eternal life is. And this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Okay, so eternal life is not just, Father, I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive my sins and come live in my heart. Boom, okay, I've got eternal life. That's not eternal life. That may be a starting point. But eternal life is knowing God, knowing the Father and walking with Jesus. So if you see somebody out there said, oh, yeah, I prayed that prayer 10 years ago and they're out living like hell. Well, guess what? They may not have eternal life. Right? Because li eternal life is actually walking in and knowing God. Might know is the Greek word ginosko. It means to learn to know, come to know, get a knowledge of, perceive, feel. To know, understand, perceive, have knowledge of. It's a Jewish idiom for sexual intercourse between a man and a woman. To become acquainted with, to know. So we can see here that to know something is used to describe also the relationship between a man and a woman through sexual intercourse. This same word is also used in Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through, 24 through 25. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did did as the angel of the Lord had hidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew, that's the word gnosko, her not. Okay, so notice here it's talk, referring to the sexual intercourse between a man and a woman. Knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. The Hebrew equivalent to gnosko is the word yada, and we see that in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, okay, there's Yada, knew Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, okay? Is that weird, or is there something more the Jewish and Jewish people understood about knowing something that we've kind of taken for granted, okay? We get, we hear something, we go, oh yeah, I know it. But if they're relating knowledge to the intimacy between a man and a woman, perhaps there's more to knowledge than what we are thinking, Oh, yeah, I know that verse, but have you encountered that verse? Have you actually dove into that verse and had that verse become life to you? That's where we get into knowledge. It's like we might understand, hey, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We might know that verse, but do we know that verse? Have we taken and held and had that, word, that verse become the word made flesh in us? There's a whole different realm here with knowledge than what we often think of here in America, or even in the Greek mindset, right? Greek's very linear, Hebrew's very um, holistic, thinks of big picture. This is the revelation that the Apostle John had. First John chapter, we're going to be there for a little bit, if you want to turn there. First John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Yes, John was there with Jesus. He got to be with him, lay his head on his chest. But we can have that relationship with God, engaging him in our spirit, being able to handle him, being able to just really engage him. 
For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father. So remember, what's eternal life? To know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So what's John saying here? And show unto you that eternal life. When we go out the doors, people should not have to ask if we have a relationship with God. They should be able to see it. We need to show that every place that we go because this is a relationship that we're walking in union with him and people should be able to see, wow, there's something different about that person. When I look in their eyes, I see light, which by the way, a lot of the New Age people, when they see Christians, that's what they see. They, they, they say, I don't know why they don't want to come to Christ and they'll, by their own accord, by their own mentioning, they will say, Wow, you guys just have a light. Well, don't you want that light? <laughs> okay. The eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So why are we to go out and to show people that we have life? We have eternal life because other people need to have the fellowship with the Father that we have. They're not going to know if we don't tell them. They're not going to know if they don't see it in our lives. This is one of the discussions I have regularly with God, and I say, God, I, it is pointless for me to go in and spend time with you alone if my life doesn't reflect you when I leave my, the secret place, when I leave my personal quiet time with him. We should never technically leave the secret place. We should always be walking in that place. And we'll probably look at uh, Psalm 91 a little bit later on. But we should, it should be so important to us that others want to have what we have, right? There's this place where we can go to two extremes, and we'll be talking more about this as we go on. We can either go in and all we do is spend time in the quiet time, uh, in the quiet room, secret place, behind closed doors, praying, reading the Bible, doing all that stuff. And honestly, there's some people out there, they're like, oh yeah, I've seen visions about people who are closest to God and they're, and they're always the intercessors. And I'm like, well, I, I, ha I don't have a problem with intercession. Intercession is awesome. We need intercessors, but I have a problem with that because if all they're doing is spending time in the prayer closet, then they're not busy be obeying Jesus' commands. And Jesus, it says that's how we show God that we love him. So I question those visions, honestly, when I line it up with the word of God. But we can go to another extreme where we're constantly busy out doing the work and we neglect the secret place, all right? And sometimes we can get out and we get so busy doing the work that all of a sudden we're getting worn out, we're getting tired. Well, we need to wonder, are we operating out of our, out of our own flesh doing the work or are we operating out of God? Because if it's out of God, we're operating in and from a place of rest. God's at rest right now, but yet he's working from that place of rest. And if we're in him, we need to do the same. So if we're getting worn out, we need to start, we need to take a step back. God, have I neglected you somewhere? Have I missed you somewhere? Um, I remember a minister, and I'm not going to name names about, of different ministers and ministries, but this guy, his main message was intimacy with God, being in the secret place. And there, well, there was a ministry trip he was on where he just all of a sudden had a breakdown. And he, all of a sudden, what, one of the things that came out of that, he recognized he got so focused on going around the world ministering that he neglected the secret place with the Lord. He neglected the relationship with God. He neglected doing the work from that place of being one with God and started just getting busy doing the work. It can be very easy to do. If the enemy can't stop us, he's going to get behind us and he's going to push us. All of a sudden, it's like, oh man, I don't have time to get with the Lord. I don't have time to be alone with him. I don't have time. I just got to, I'm so tired. I got to get, get to bed, get up, and just go, 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 go. And we need to, if that's our lives, we need to stop and reevaluate what's going on. Because even Jesus, at some point, he took the crowds and he said, all right, sent them away, he even sent his own disciples away so he could go up to the mountaintop to pray. We need the time alone with God. We need to be connected with him because in him, if we wait on the Lord, we will renew our strength, we'll run and not grow weary, and walk and not faint. That's in Old Testament. That's in the Old Covenant. So if that's in the Old Covenant, how much more in the New? We should be running and walk, not grow weary, and we should walk and not faint. And if we're, if we're getting that place where we're getting weary and we're fainting, that's, that's a reality check. We need to stop and go, all right, God, where have I gotten away from you? Okay, and what entered in in the Garden of Eden, uh, Genesis chapter 3, okay, it said that, because of what you have done, 
You're gonna have you're gonna work the ground and toil, hardship, struggles, things like that. Well, uh, there's a in the New Testament where it talks about though uh, you being evil know how to give good gifts. Well, anybody wondered what that word evil means? If you look it up in the Greek, full of toil, hardship, and labors, the very thing that entered in at the fall. So if we are full of toil, hardship, and labors, we're going to have to stop and go, uh-oh, where, are we le- where have we left God? We need to get back to the secret place. We need to get back to him. We need to get back to being one with him because that's what Jesus paid for. We, couldn't, we could not have access and relationship with the Father because of, because of sin. And we had this law that was, kept us working, 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 and we could not meet that law. Jesus paid the price that we could have boldness and access to the Father with confidence, as it says in Ephesians. We need to take advantage of that. Is we, if we miss that, then we've missed the whole point of this walk. We've missed the whole point of being able to show people, to evangelize people properly. It's like, okay, you want everything to go well? Here, pray this prayer. Uh-uh. Let me introduce you to Papa. Let me introduce you to the one who gives life. Let me introduce you to the healer. Let me introduce you to the one who is the great I am. Let me introduce you to the one who always sees who is the provider. Let me introduce you to the one who's the all-knowing, the life creator, who lives in me right now. That's what it's about. It's about knowing him. And if that, that needs to change how we evangelize people because if, all, if it's all about manipulating people to get them to pray a prayer so we can get another notch on the belt and go, oh yeah, I had 600 salvations. Really, how many disciples did you make? How many people that you, did you get to pray that prayer are walking with God and actually know him? Or is it a one-time thing where you had the music playing, got people's souls all stirred up? I can do that with a movie, for crying out loud. And I'm not against movies, but you know that's what a lot of the music's there for, is to get the soul stirred up and we can cry and all that. And a lot of churches do that in the service. And there's some fruit from it, but you know what? This is all about relationship with God and really knowing him. Verse 4, in these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Okay, so he wants us to really encounter this relationship that John had with God, with Jesus. He wants everyone to have. That's why he's writing this letter. Why? So that our joy can be full. If we're not experiencing joy in our life, that's another thing. Check, stop. Am I having joy in this Christian walk or is it feeling like it's laborsome? Because maybe we're not walking in relationship with God if if we're not uh, encountering the joy of being with him. This then is the message which we have heard of him declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Well, okay, that seems to be different than what we hear in a lot of places. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Then, you know, getting back to what we talked about in the Sunday morning Bible school, why do we think we can continue in sin if God is light and in him is no darkness at all? Why do we think we can continue living in darkness when God has put us into the light and that's where he is? So we have to question, if we think it's okay to go sin, to go uh, get drunk, to go around committing adultery, to go, you know, whatever Jesus said, you know what, if you even entertain the thoughts and you've already committed adultery, you know, entertaining those thoughts, whatever it is, why do we think it's okay to go doing that when that's darkness, and in God there's no light, there's no, um, it's, he's light, and there is no darkness. If we want to have a relationship with him, we need to put to death the deeds of the flesh, and we need to step into the spirit and step into the light and be light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. It's light, and there's no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. Oh, how many times do we hear that in church? Oh, no. That, no, you, you know what? You don't want to say that. That's just mean. You cannot go and tell people that they're lying. Well, what did John say? If we say that we have fellowship with him, we walk in darkness, we lie. And are we lying to people when we tell them that, okay, you, pr- you prayed a prayer and you're going to heaven and you're good, and yet they go out and just live the life that they, they, they think they're going to heaven, they go live the life that they were living prior to praying that prayer? Are we doing people a a disservice? We lie and do not the truth. So we're lying and we're not doing the truth if we're living in darkness. But 
If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So when we choose to walk in the light, get out of the darkness, step into the light, we have fellowship not only with him, but guess what? We have fellowship with each other. That's awesome. We cannot have true relationship with each other if we can't be open and honest with each other. If we can't go to each other and go, hey, you know what? I'm struggling with this. Can you pray for me? Because that's where the enemy's playground is, is in the darkness, right? I love quote a, quote a movie, Crocodile McDundee. And uh, there's this one scene where, if I remember the girl's name anyway, she's talking to Crocodile McDundee. What, don't you have shrinks? He's like, oh, no, we don't have any shrinks in Australia. We just go tell Wally. Wally tells everyone else it's out in the open, no more problem. All right, so the devil wants us to say, he's like, oh man, I'm only one uh, wrestling with this. Oh my gosh, you know, I had a, I had a lustful thought and uh, you know what, I can't let anyone else know. And then the enemy beats us up, beats us up, beats us up, beats us up until we get that thing out there. We confess it maybe to a brother or to a sister or whatever it might be. Better if men confess to men and women confess to women things. <laughs> and then get prayer and stand with one another because then the enemy has no ground to play. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what's he saying there? Okay, if we, if we say we don't have sin, we're a liar. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more because too many people have used that to say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. We're all going to sin. That's not what he's saying here. Okay? If you are a sinner saved by grace, then you might want to question what you believe because either you're a sinner or you're saved by grace it's not both if you're saved by grace you are made righteous in him you're not a sinner any longer Paul did not say to the sinners at the church of Ephesus no he wrote to the saints saints means holy ones so Paul was addressing them as who they are in Christ to the holy ones if you're in Christ you are already holy you're made morally faultless and there's nothing wrong with you if you remain in him and walk in the light as he is in the light so if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I was having a discussion with some people earlier. How many people have we encountered onto the street and say, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I'm good. God, God and I have a deal. right? And, they, and they're going around saying that everything's perfect. That, yeah, I'm, I'm going to heaven because God and I, we work this thing out. It's okay for me to go and, and participate in this thing or you know, whatever, whatever it might be. We have a deal. It's okay for me to go watch this movie. I had a friend of mine, he watched, I'm trying to remember what movie he watched. The movie, Jen and I turned it on because he recommended it and you could feel the witchcraft on the movie and we're like, don't want it. So we got rid of it and did, decided not to watch it and he's like, oh yeah, I feel it on there, but you know what, it's a good movie, so I'm gonna watch it anyway. Uh, I don't want to fill myself with those things. If, that, if you want to do that and you think you have an agreement with God, then you go for it. Let's see how much of an impact you have on the world. So now, remember we talked about if we say that we don't have sin, we make out to be a liar. Okay, well, let's go on to this next, next verse, chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. So this isn't about us sinning. He wrote these things that we won't sin. All right, we have to read everything in context. Maybe one of these Sundays, if I have an opportunity, or maybe at the internship that there's going to be the first two weeks of January, which, by the way, put a little plug in. All right, internship, first two weeks of January. You're going to be going through how to study the Bible, how to stir ourselves up, how to do declarations. What it, we're going to be a whole bunch of awesome things during those two weeks, first two weeks of January, and then we're going to go into DBI year one. If you haven't been through it, highly recommend it, even if you've been through it online. I highly recommend you sign up, uh, go online, call the church, whatever you need to do, and contact my wife, Jen. She'll plug you in. She's looking at me, what did you just volunteer me for? <laughs> Even if you've been through it online, there is a difference of getting the exposure in a classroom with other people that are going through it with you. It is, it, it's, just, it's a whole different experience. It's awesome. So he wrote these things that we wouldn't sin, and if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father. So I write these things to you so that you'll be in the light as he is in the light, 
and so that you won't sin. But if you do, you do have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation, the substitution for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. This is where people go off. All right? They think that because Jesus was the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, the whole world is saved. The whole world's not saved until they enter into relationship with Papa and with Jesus. And hereby, we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So here's a sure sign. John tells us, all right, you want to know how to know him? If you're keeping his commandments, do you know him? If you're not, well, you may want to question if you really know him. He says, he that says I know him and keeps not his commandments. Oh, here he goes again. Dang, that John, he's just, he's, you know, John, I really wish that you would just be softer with me. Keeps not his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keeps his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. Okay, so how do we know we're in him? He says it. Keep his word. Plain and simple. This is what the Jews, Jewish leaders of Jesus' day missed. John 5, verses 38 through 40. And you have not his word abiding in you. This is Jesus talking. For from whom he has sent him, you don't believe. You search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they, and they are the very things which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I know for there was a number of years in my life that Search the scriptures, study the scriptures, get in there, know all that. You search out the Greek, you search out the Hebrew, and I still do that and still encourage that. But if that's the extent that we're studying the Bible and we think that we know God, uh-oh, Jesus, Jesus just said, you guys search the scriptures because you think in them you have life, but these are the scriptures that point to me. How many people out there, I just got an email across the, uh, across my, in my inbox that was talking about this person sent this big rebuke back because somebody in their congregation had started praying for the sick. And they're like, well, healing's not biblical. And started Greek and Hebrew it and all that. So they're studying these things out and breaking out the Greek and Hebrew. But these are the very scriptures that point to Christ. I'm sorry, you're not going to convince me that God doesn't heal. Right? There's a, there's a scene in the, I don't recommend watching the movie because the language and stuff like that's not good, but a number of years ago, Goodwill Hunting, and people see that movie. There's a scene, right, right uh, where Matt Damon is talking to Robin Williams in their first encounter there, and Matt Damon is looking all around the room trying to find something where he can nail Robin Williams. All right, so Matt Damon finally sees a painting on the wall, and then he starts picking Robin Williams' life apart because of the colors in it that he had read in a book. And Robin Williams was torn apart at that moment, but then he went home you know, and he scheduled another meeting with Matt Damon. They met in the park the next day, and Robin Williams said, you know what, you ripped my life yesterday, but then it got to a point where I was able to sleep by the baby. And you know what came that revelation? You're just a boy. You could go through and you could tell me everything about, uh, about that painting and from a book that you read, but you don't know me. You could tell me everything that you've read about the Sistine Chapel, but you've never gone and stood in it and looked up at the ceiling and gazed at it with the smells and seen the colors and been there in the whole atmosphere. You've never done it, but yet you think you know everything about me because of a book and looking at one painting. And that's how a lot of people are with God. They think they know everything because they've read the Bible. For crying out loud, I could point out to you on Jeopardy, they have categories there, Psalms and all that stuff, but the people that are answering these questions about the Bible don't know the author of the Bible. We need to know him. Don't, you know, people don't come to me and try to tell me that God doesn't heal until you've actually gone out and put your faith in God and trust and laid hands and seen deaf ears open, seen blind eyes open, seen tumors fall off of people. You're not going to convince me otherwise because I've had the, the privilege of experiencing what John did, of being able to handle that word of life. And that's what the people in this world are longing for. They're longing for a people that really, really, really know this word of life and, and to manifest him to them. We need to become the word made flesh. That is, 
it's not just this cute little thing. It is truth. Our flesh needs to get out of the way. And the very word, if Jesus was the word made flesh and we're in him, then we need to let him manifest through us. We need to become the word made flesh. Where everything that we're saying, everything that we're doing, everything we're thinking is him. And it's not impossible. If we think that we can't know his will, well, then we don't know him. Hey, bottom uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says that these things were hidden from the princes of the world, but he has revealed them to us by his spirit. You have to start to wonder if you have his Holy Spirit, if God's will is a mystery to you. You have to wonder, maybe you've received his spirit, but maybe you haven't engaged in relationship and intimacy with him. Start talking to him. Start asking to him. He, Jesus promised when, the, when he comes, he will lead you into all truth and tell you of things that are to come. God's will is not supposed to be a mystery to those that walk with him and know him that are in the kingdom. Now back to John 17.3. The word translated might know is in the present active subjunctive. It could be translated may be knowing. This indicates that God, God is not a, knowing God is not a one-time event. It's a continual relationship day in and day out, just like marriage. Right? You've heard me use that analogy before. Marriage is not saying your vows at the altar and going, peace, babe. I'm, I'm with you. I said my vows, but now I'm going to go out and hang at the bars, pick on women and all that other stuff. It's not, it's not that at all. That's how we treat God. We're so presumptuous on him. We're too familiar with the God that we barely know. And that needs to change. As we said, there's going to be people that think they know God that really don't because they've been in church. Maybe people that are sitting under the teaching of this ministry that think that they're walking with God is like, oh yeah, well, I'm affiliated with JGLM. Great. Do you know God? Let's take a look at Luke chapter 13, verses 23 through 30. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he, Jesus, said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open unto us and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence you are. <laughs> then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in your presence and you have taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not from where you have come from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you are thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first and there shall be first which shall be last. Jesus, didn't, Jesus was pretty blunt. Look, there's people that are going to come and say to me, hey, we ate in your presence. We drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. Other people are going to say, we were in your churches. We heard your teaching. We went and participated in Bible study. And they're knocking at the door wanting to get in the wedding feast. And Jesus said, I don't know where you have come from. Whew. I don't know about you. That puts the fear of God in me. I, we need to walk in such a way where we know him. Depart from me, for I know not where you've come from. Well, yeah, we see that one other time in the Bible. Let's look at Job at 1.7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Where are you coming from? Uh-oh. He says the very words to these people that sat in his very presence, sat under his teaching, he said to Satan. That's a humbling thought right there. Being a part of church, being a part of any ministry, being part of whatever it might be, does not guarantee we know him that we're going to sit in the marriage supper at the Lamb. We need to develop this intimacy with God. We need to walk with him. So we're not one of the ones that's saying, yeah, we sound under your teaching, but no, your teaching has become flesh in me and it's lived out in my life. I obey your commands. I'm one with you. Just as it says in Corinthians that we will um, know even as we are fully known. Now, 
Matthew 7, verses 13 through 27. Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto eternal life, and few be there that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. I'm going to stop there for a second. Most of the time when we hear that passage, we think of fruit. The emphasis here is tree. Good tree brings forth good fruit. And a lot of times we hear, oh my gosh, I just told a lie. Uh, I just, oh man, I have to, and we start focusing on the fruit. Jesus said somewhere else, you make the tree good and the fruit will be good. Guess what? If you're in Christ, your tree's good. The pro, the, are we letting that life come out of us to produce the good fruit? If, as soon as we start getting fruit focused, well, then we're forever going to be fruit focused and we're always going to be trying to clip all those bad fruit that come off rather than letting the life of God, the good tree, come up out of us, right? What, is it, what did Jesus say? We've been grafted into the vine. Paul said that in Romans as well. Okay? If we've been grafted into the good vine, we are in a good tree. We need to have more faith in God being able to keep us and manifest himself through us than we have in our ability to produce bad fruit. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Not every prophet that's out there prophesying in the name of God is connected with God. Okay, we can take and we can take it back to the word. And with that said, there are some prophecies out there, people are prophesying based on their current knowledge. All right, there's a lot of prophecies out there, basically are old covenant mindsets. All right, there's one out there right now that's talking about, which this is a recycled prophecy, by the way. If you follow prophecy enough, a lot of the big ones that are out there, you see every few years, they kind of get recycled. So this is one out there about the double portion, getting the double portion of Elisha, right? The double portion of Elijah and the raising up sons of Elisha. God is not pouring out double portions. The double portion, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, was the portion of the firstborn son. Who's the firstborn son? Jesus. Are we in him? Are we complete in him? Okay, if that's the case, then why do we need double? How do you do double portion of complete? How do you do double portion of we're filled with him? It, it, we, it doesn't work. All right, that's an Old Testament mindset, all right? And we don't go and criticize and judge people. We can pray for them because maybe that's just their revelation right now. Because I know people that are out preaching stuff like that that are seeing metal dissolve out of people, but they're moving in faith based on what they know. So I praise God for that. But there's this other place if they come to the realization of who Christ is and who they are in Christ and being one with him, that you're not trying to get a whole nother anointing, that we are in the anointed one. And in your name have cast out devils. Ooh, there's another big one. All right, so we go and cast out devils. We use the name of Jesus. Doesn't mean we know him. It doesn't talk about laying and done in your name many wonderful works, right? We can, might be able to include healing the sick in that. There's yogis and other people that are out there healing the sick, but they're not connected with God. All right, what's Curry say? The power of God's mechanical. You can do this stuff outside of being one with God. So just prophesying, just doing wonderful works, just doing all those things does not make us Christian. What makes us Christian, little Christ, is being one with him, knowing him. That's what the world's waiting for. And then, will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, workers of lawlessness. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine, oh, here we go, now he's, de now he's describing what it is, how come they were workers of iniquity. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will like him, him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the, a rock. So the works of iniquity were not doing the works of Christ. 
they were not found in him. They were not, did not have their whole life founded upon that rock. And that's one of the ways that we're going to know who's part of God and who's not. When the rain and the winds come, who's still left standing? And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Okay? If we're not connected with God, the winds come, the rains come, all that stuff, we're going to be acting just like the world. Oh God, why did you let this happen? Oh God, he's just like Job's wife. Curse your God and die. That's where we're really going to know if we know him or not, is when those times come. You're right. You're right. God caused the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. There could be times we think that just because we get into this relationship with God, that everything's going to be um, peaches and flowers and all that from this moment forward. Uh, no, we enter into that place, like Paul said, of I learn to be content whether I have a lot or if I have a little. I am not changed because he is not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I shouldn't change. I should be the same yesterday, today, and forever, regardless if I have a lot or if I have a little. Which, by the way, I believe that that's one of the reasons that we, Jesus did not initially rebuke the storm for the disciples. Jesus was sleeping on the boat. The storm was going on. The storm was, he knew who he was. He knew that he was going to accomplish the purpose for which God sent him. And it didn't matter what wind, waves, and whatever came against him. He was going to fulfill that purpose. I believe he rebuked that storm for the disciples. Because they were freaking out. And he says, all right, peace be still, you of little faith. He did that for them, not for himself. All right? When Paul encountered storms, he didn't, go, he didn't go and rebuke the storm either. He was at peace the whole time. He's like, yeah, angel of the Lord appeared to me, and he's given me all you on this boat, so I'm not worried. Could Paul have rebuked the storm? Yeah, he could have, but he was in that place of peace, and we're at peace. We don't worry about the storms. We may say, peace be still, to help pe give peace to people around us, and they go, who the heck's that person that even commands the winds and the waves? Psalm 91. We're going through a lot of scripture here, so I would encourage you to take it home, go meditate on it, study it, and even... Ask the Lord help to develop a response, how uh, change maybe how you're evangelizing people and how to help them engage in this relationship with him. Psalm 91. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. All right, so if we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Dwell means we stay there. That doesn't mean that we go in and we close the door and we're there 24-7. It means we, we can go in and have those private times with God, but when we leave there, we're not leaving him. We remain in him. We walk in him. We stay with him. We stay in step with him. And we, if we do that, we'll stay under the shadow of the Almighty. Right? And that's what Curry says a lot, is that one of our biggest problems is that we poke our head out. And the devil goes, oh, there you are. We're supposed to re remain hidden in him, right? Colossians chapter 3. Our life is hidden in Christ. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. So notice, prerequisite. He who dwells in the secret place in the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the mighty, and the person who's dwelling in that place shall be able to say of the Lord, he is my refuge and fortress. How many times, I did, you know, I know I've done it, where I've gotten too busy, kind of gotten away from God, and I've become presumptuous on his promises. But when we neglected the secret place, and we're going, God's my refuge, God's my fortress, and well, how come it's not working? Well, maybe we left the relationship. Those who dwell in the secret place in the Most High shall, dwell, shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That person will say, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. How can you trust the person that you don't know? Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. So notice, right, this is all going back to verse 1, dwelling in that secret place. The promise is if we stay there, right, the same promises that we have in Christ, we remain in Christ, we shall be delivered from the snare of the fowler, from the noisome pestilence. He sh all right, so big to do about flu and all this other stuff, which I honestly, my opinion, I don't see why it's even 
get, why you should even get a flu shot when there's only 20% effective. They don't know which one they're vaccinating for. Um, I read a report recently, people are getting par paralyzed from flu shot. There's been five deaths just in the last, uh, within the last year, people getting flu shots. Uh, uh, no thanks. <laughs> And it says, if we dwell in the secret place of the most, most High, I don't care if the flu becomes a pestilence. We're the answer for that. We need to stay with him. We need to walk in him. And if we do that, God promised he'll protect us from it. And then we could go, oh, you have that? You've got that flu? Well, guess what? I'm protected from it because I'm connected with the Father. And let me introduce you for him. Flu, go in Jesus' name. Here, do you want to you come to that relationship I have so we can have fellowship alone with another? Let's do it. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall trust. His truth shall be shield and buckler. All right? What did Jesus tell the Pharisees? And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Jesus is our shield and our buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night. All right? We'll be able to lay down and sleep. We'll, we can and not be worried about what the next day is going to bring. All right. Let's say I die in my sleep. Okay, I know where I'm going. I live in the light. We're children of the day and not of the night. Nor for the arrow that flies by day. Okay, wars, rumors of wars. Not worried. All right, I've said this verse before, Isaiah 60. Okay, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has been risen upon you. Though deep darkness cover the earth, and darkness cover the sea, but the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon you. And they shall come, Gentiles shall come to the brightness of your rising. Okay, I don't, I'm not going to get into people's theology on end time stuff, but here's the bottom line. It says in the Bible, Isaiah 60, darkness is going to come to maturity, light's coming to maturity at the exact same time. The good thing is, is as the world gets darker, the light gets shining brighter, and we can have more of an impact. There's going to be a greater distinction, the wheat and the tares. Okay? A thousand shall fall at your side. We may see people fall. John G. Lake, when he was in Africa, saw people fall. Right? They said it was a uh, bubonic plague. It probably wasn't, but it was another deadly disease. I, th what is I think it was malaria, actually. But in any event, he was able to walk through that and not die. And people are like, how are you not getting sick? Well, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from law, sin, and death. And then they took a sample of that from a recently dead person, checked into the microscope, saw, it was, saw that it was still living, put it in his hand, and he said, all right, take it off, check it, and the, and the organism was dead. I'm like, how did you do that? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What if we walked in that confidence in God? What if we knew God like that? Where we're not confident, we're like, that person has a contagious disease, I'm not going to lay hands on them, and uh, man, I better put gloves on before I lay hands on them. Well, guess what? We're already telling that thing we're afraid of it. A thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand right hand, it, but it shall not come near you. And I would beg, because it's darkness, we're light, it, darkness can't exist in light. Not to mention, I'm willing to bet that things are supposed to be afraid of us. Right? They may try to intimidate us, but we just go, really? Get out of here in Jesus' name. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord my refuge, the most high, your habitation. There shall no evil befall you. Neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. This is, remember, Jesus hadn't come yet when this was written. So, if under the Old Testament, this was a possibility, how much more in Christ? We have a better covenant made with better promises. Maybe we need to start believing for more, start walking in more. Four, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all his ways, which a lot of us are familiar with that verse because it was the verse that the Satan took out of context to try to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. Okay, he took that out of context, but the whole point is remain in the secret place in the Most High. This is a promise of those who remain in the secret place. What was Satan trying to do? Here, come out of that place. Come out, come on. I know you're one with God. Come out from there and, and obey what I want you to do. And Jesus is like, uh-uh. He didn't go, well, Satan, that's out of context. Actually, it says this. No, he said, thou shalt not put the Lord God to the test. Use scripture to combat it. 
They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you shall dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shall, shall you trample underfoot. Because, here's God talking, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. He shall call me and I will answer him. Maybe if we're not having our prayers answered, we need to stop and go, am I walking in a relationship with God or am I only talking to him when I have a need? Relationships go both ways. We need to talk and we need to listen. We're so good at asking God, oh, I need a new job. God, I, need, uh, I have this bill due and I don't have the money. God, uh, I, need, I need these clothes. God, God, God. And we spend all that time asking questions and he promised if you seek first my kingdom and my, and, and my righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. All right? He promised that. We need to walk in relationship with him and receive those promises. And he promises that when we call on him, right, which is what Jesus said in John 15, all right, we also see that in 1 John chapter uh, 3, I believe it is, okay, that there's ways that we absolutely know that we shall have all our prayers answered. And the big key right here is walking in the light as he is in the light. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. Does it say might? Does it say maybe? Does it say, uh, well, if it's my will in that situation? No, it doesn't. Right? And the, so, which, by the way, we should not be praying, God, if it be your will, right? If we're, if we're in him, we should already know his will and we should act upon his will. It says here, I will deliver him. This is a promise. There are no conditions attached except for walking in relationship with him. And honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. All right, this is like a child who decides that he wants to disown his parents. All right, so I, all right, I'm going. And then parents pass away, and then the child goes, well, how come I wasn't left in that will? How come I don't get an inheritance? You forsook your parents. You walked out. Why should you think that you have any part um, to partake in the, in the inheritance? That's how it is with God. For those of us who walk away from him, why do we think that it's okay that we should get anything from God? It's not. We presume upon him way too much, and we need to get to know this God that, that is just amazing and awesome. We have the privilege of entering into relationship with. Exodus 33, verse 11. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. There's a whole book written about Joshua. Could it be that the great exploits that he did and the reason why he was chosen to be the leader over, Israel's, uh, over Israel after the parting of Moses was because he loved being with God? Because he had this relationship with God, God gave him some mighty promises. Joshua 1. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, unto the land which I give to them, to the children of Israel. Here's one of the promises. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Another promise. There shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. 
Be strong and of a good courage, courage, for unto this people shall you divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Joshua loves staying in the secret place. And now Moses departed. He's raised up as a, as a leader of Israel. And here God's given him precious promises that he can bank on. So Joshua was able to move in this confidence toward God. And this resulted in great victory. And we see that great victory here in Joshua chapter 6, verses 20 through 21. Talking, of, referring to Jericho. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. Joshua went and moved according to the promises of God that was given to him, and they utterly destroyed Jericho because he, he walked in relationship with him. He took God at his word. But then we see just um, one chapter later, something happened. Joshua 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to, to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. Make not all the people to labor there, for there are, they are but few. So there went up of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. So what do we see there? Joshua sent the men up to Ai. They came back with their report. Do we see any communication with God there? Joshua was like, oh, God gave me these promises. I uh, went out. We saw the victory last time, so I'm just going to keep moving forward. I'm not going to talk to God and listen to the report of man and what happened. They ended up fleeing. Became a little, is it possible that Joshua became a little presumptuous on the promise of God? And the men of Ai smote them, about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them before the gates even unto Shab Shabaram, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So after all this, and sometimes, honestly, even though I hate cir uh, bad circumstances, tragedy, whatever else, sometimes it takes those things that, to get us back to the place, like, oh my gosh, I missed it, I've left God. That's what happened here with Joshua. Verse 10. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get up! Why do you lie... On your face, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. All right? Is it possible that if Joshua would have communicated with God, that he could have known about the sin in the camp before moving forward? Then, he's got his communion back with the Lord. They dealt with the sin of the camp. Chapter 8. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, so God reaffirming the covenant with him now, the promises, and his people and his city and his land. And you shall do to Ai and her king as you did to Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof in the cattle thereof shall you take for a prey unto yourselves. Now, this last little part here, God gives Joshua's strategy on how to take the city. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. Sometimes we can get so presumptuous on God and moving forward in his promises that we forget God may have a strategy to take the city. The promises are awesome. We can take them at his word, but we need to walk in relationship with them. And God may say, yeah. That promise is for you, but here's the, here's the way to do it, and it's going to save you a lot of heartache if you do it this way. We can become so promise-of-God-focused that we miss the promise giver. 
We can go out and we can declare the promises, declare the promises, declare the promises, and never commune with the one who gave the promises in the first place. Knowing the promises of God does not mean that we know God. We can take for granted, take for granted that, um, that we know him because we pray in tongues, we see healings, prophecy, and the like, but it doesn't mean that we're right with him. We know from 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. And since God is love, we can substitute God in for love in 1 Corinthians 13. Let's take a look at that, replacing love with God. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not God, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains and have not God, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not God, it profits me nothing. We can go and do all these things, absence, and it says love there, but we know God is love. We can do all these things in the absence of God, but it says if we, we can have faith to move mountains, we can go ahead and do that, but we're nothing. We can give our bodies to just be, go through fire and be tortured, but it profits us nothing if we don't know him. Let's conclude with this. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars and have borne and have patience and have, and for my name's sake have labored and have not fainted. Nevertheless, I have this against you because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you are fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your candlestick out of its place, except you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the, unto the churches. To him, right? He wrote this to the churches in Ephesus, but notice it said, let the Spirit hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. It's just as real for the church of Ephesus as it is for us today. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Could it be that some of us have become flippant with the promises of God and have forsaken our first love? Right? The word love here is agape, same word used in 1 John 4 eight, same word used in 1 Corinthians. So what if really what the Apostle John was saying here, because you have left your first God, You've made going out and correcting wrong doctrine your God. You've made going out and healing the sick your God. You've made tithing your God. Whatever it might be, you've left your first love. You've left God and made these other things God instead of Jesus. We can get so busy doing the work that we forget the one that we're doing the work for. And it's that we need to not do that. We need to remember he's at rest. We need to be at rest. And we need to work from that place of rest. Remember what I said earlier, if we find our place self toiling, striving, laboring, maybe we've left God because everything that we're doing should be in a place where we're waiting on him, we're intertwined with him like the cords of a rope and our strength is constantly being renewed. And we run and not grow weary and we walk and not faint. Could it be that we become too familiar with the God that we barely know? So maybe there's most of you out here are just doing awesome and you're walking with God, and that's amazing. But maybe there's some of you out here that this message is pricking you on the heart. And if it is, maybe before you leave here today, just take some time in your seat. We're going into communion, and what a better... I, I don't know if there's a better way to think of reconnecting with God and getting to know him, entering into that fellow. That's what communion means, is fellowship. We're being partakers, we're partaking into his suffering, partaking of his death. We proclaim his death until he comes. So you don't need anybody to pray for you. You just need to get, go to God. God, I've thought wrong. I repent. I turn away, I turn away from those things, and I want to recommit, connect. I want to recommit. I want to be with you and start building that relationship again.
I feel like this is a word for somebody. Your marriage has fallen apart and you've lost connection with your spouse. Have that conversation with your spouse. Say, we've drifted apart, we need to stop, and let's begin getting to know each other again. Tell God that you're sorry for forsaking him as your first love. Repent, let him talk to you. This is not something that you need to come down, you know, I already said you don't need to come down and get prayer for, right? It's just about walking in intimacy with him. A lot of times we think that if I just get prayer from the man up front, everything will be okay. No. This is about your relationship with him. Please connect with him. If you don't leave here knowing him better than when you walked in, then I haven't done my job. And that's sad. It's really sad. So before we actually enter into communion, why don't you just take some time, talk to God, hear what's on his heart. If you have walked away from him and are gotten busy, just let him um, repent and say, all right, God, from this moment forward, I want to know you.